Five panellists, five topical issues, no holds barred. For me, it's not knowledge that's lacking. It's that greed, it's that mentality where you feel you deserve to take your own and take it infinitely and let everybody else just manage however they will manage. We're almost becoming hardwired to try and cheat. I would, you know, suggest that we begin to hold our leaders accountable. There was a time in this country when yes. things actually work. I don't think that any organization should be above the law. And I think one of the challenges we have in this country is about governance across the board. Well, well, what I'm saying is that it doesn't really affect us in Nigeria. I don't know what we can do if the system is already corrupted. We've been warned as a continent of the influx of the Chinese. If you don't repay your debt, they will just colonize you. Welcome to The Advocate on PLUS TV Africa. Never let it be said that we are not about nailing down practical solutions. I kick off the discussions by recommending we bake a bigger pie. Simple, really. Ekene is staring us up to be battle ready, whereas some might be puzzled as to what battle she is conditioning us for in the first place. Liberus, satirical and topical as usual, faces the contract bazaar and brings to mind the saying, it takes a spoonful of sugar to help the medicine go down. Rookie, tired of beating around the bush, calls it like it is. A system rigged against women. What system, you ask? Our political system, of course. Chuka nails it succinctly. He's talking the ritual of life. Sounds mystical. Get ready for another practical session that takes on the big conversations right here after the break. Some might say Oliver Twist had the right idea. I say, why suffer in silence? My advocacy today is called, the pie is too small, so bake a bigger one. Let's carry out a little thought experiment. If you can picture in your mind the total amount of money that has been illegally siphoned from Nigeria's government from independence in 1960 to date, and then compare that to the, uh, the total amount of Nigeria's total infrastructure deficit, that is, the monetary value of the schools, roads, hospitals, railways, uh, water systems, ports, research institutes, power stations, dams, and all the other things that it would take for Nigeria to provide an acceptable standard of living to its 180 million people. In your mind, think of which of these two figures is bigger. Now, if you believe that the stolen funds are greater, raise your left index finger. If you believe the infrastructure deficit is greater, raise your right index finger. Now let's look at the facts. According to a Chatham House report published in 2019, the total estimated value of illegal financial outflows from Nigeria since independence stands at a staggering 582 billion US dollars. That is a lot of money. According to the African Development Bank, however, Nigeria's current infrastructure deficit stands at roughly $100 billion annually, which means that if not quickly addressed, Nigeria could have an infrastructure deficit of $3 trillion by 2044. So if you put up your left index finger, you are woefully mistaken. That little experiment is one way of capturing the basic misconception at the heart of how successive Nigerian governments formulate economic policy and why Nigerian voters consistently make the electoral decisions that they do. In two of my previous appearances on this show, I have spoken about Nigeria's economic the Wakanda complex and its preference for leaders whose skill is fighting enemies instead of nation building. Both of these issues boil down to the basic assumption that the existing oil revenue pie is or can be enough to sustain 180 million people. So instead of trying to grow our objectively small economy and making it big enough for everyone to participate satisfactorily, we thus end up fighting an eternal losing battle for our share of this tiny and shrinking crude oil revenue pie. At election time, instead of voting for candidates who have plans to grow the economy by encouraging innovation and enhanced private participation, which leads to broad-based accumulation of wealth, we instead vote for demagogues who promise that they will fight corruption, as though Nigeria's $20 billion annual government budget can even make a dent in Nigeria's economic problem. For reference, Egypt's 2020 budget stands at $106.2 billion for its 98 million people, which averages out at about $1,000 per Egyptian per year. 
Our equivalent figure is $111.11 per Nigerian per year. Now, for the sake of argument, let's say you could magically push a button to end corruption. And at the same time, oil prices could go up to $150 per barrel. And Nigeria could maintain peak production with zero leakages for one year. So that's 3.2 million uh, barrels per day. If you prorate that over a year, Nigeria would make about $175 billion. Now, you remove 50% for the NNPC's joint venture partner, and that leaves us with about $87.6 billion for 118 million people. And that comes to about $486 per Nigerian per year, which is still less than half of Egypt's per capita budget. Do you see the point? Nigeria is and has always been a miserably poor country. Even at the peak of the oil boom in the 1970s, Nigeria's per capita GDP stood at $556, which is $2,577 in today's money. Our current per capita GDP stands at $2,081, so clearly not much has changed since that time, except the number of people now competing for a share of the same limited pie. Our economic problem is poverty. The economy is too small, and we need more income, which can only come through privately driven production and innovation. The political solution to this economic problem is to amend the constitution to make it investment friendly, and for us to vote for candidates who will grow the economy instead of the state. The solution is not to give our mandate to those whose only stock in trade, is to give us bedtime stories and Nollywood morality tales about corruption. After 60 years of fairy tales, I think it's time for us to grow up. Should I jump in? Because <laughs> I wish, sorry, I can see Libras are not coming, but let me quickly say this. I wish, um, I, I see where you're going, but I wish the um, corruption we speak of had just that uh, in terms of the price tag. But it comes with, it, it actually lowers morale. So it, it affects everything else. Mm -hmm. So if it was just the cost of corruption in terms of something you could quantify in figures, we'll say, fine, you know, I get your point. But corruption actually takes away the incentive for anyone to want to make any useful contribution to the economy. Mm -hmm. So as long as that corruption is still running its course, nobody is like putting water in a bucket with holes. Nobody will want to make any meaningful investment. So we actually need to still stay on the corruption thing. The, but like uh, someone said on the last advocacy, you can walk and chew gum. So you can actually deal with corruption and you can deal with the money issue, and you can deal with the investments you spoke of, which is the private sector innovation. Mm. But to say you will leave corruption to one side, it's not going to happen because nobody will want to make any useful. Corruption is what creates what they call a disenabling environment. Mm. To, to create an enabling environment that will drive innovation and drive, drive that kind of creativity, Nigerians are very creative people. You have to plug those leaks, and that's the corruption. Quickly, side. before Liberos jumps okay. in, let me just do a 30-second uh, reply to that. And the, the counterpoint to that is that there is nothing special about Nigeria's corruption. Other places have the exact same corruption. But the difference between it. us and them is that they have bigger economies, so they're able to absorb a lot of the impact that we can't. No, so it's a lot more visible in our case because we are poor. No, but you can't um, say they've left no. corruption. Yeah, yeah. They've left then, corruption then, then to run rampant. The but Libras, then they're please. no longer the same mm. because mm. Yeah, why would you? Nigeria is not more corrupt than Russia. Well, I can. I, 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 would prob, I would probably say it is because if you know you are that small, why are you that corrupt anyway? Whereas you know, you know, you get where I'm going. I said, if I've got five naira and you've got ten, and then I want to be as corrupt as you, I'm, I'm very stupid because I've only got five naira and I will run out of money quicker than you. So I should reduce my corruption, even if to be yeah, proportional. Yeah, yeah. We're not. It's not proportional. So there's something no, I, very I think, wrong. I think um, we're all basically saying the same thing. Mm. But the issue here is. Mm. If you, there are certain things you would do to open up your economy and that will, you know, disincentivize corruption. Exactly. Naturally, all those oh, things yeah. will no longer be attractive. Yes. Because if I know, why wouldn't I want to be corrupt? Because I know that if I work, I will get money. And I can afford all of those things that ordinarily if I steal, I would afford. So if you create opportunities, for businesses to thrive. Why will a man want to just sit down and not work and then make money? And also, it will be unattractive because the people that are watching over some of those businesses will feel, look, I, I work, and then I would not encourage you to sit down and not work. And so, and that's why also, if you, let's, let's take example with um, uh, the banks. There were time in this country where, you know, the old generation banks were just there. And then came the new generation banks. 
And no matter the facade, no matter the abracadabra economics and the voodoo economics that they did, at that time they were able to create jobs. And whilst they were creating jobs, this song about corruption reduced. Naturally, it will die down. And so because that life that the politician can, would live, you see some bankers were even living a better life. Yes. And so it was no longer attractive for people to want to go into politics but to want to work in some of these big companies. You see people wanting to, aspiring to work in telecoms. Mm. Also, some of them wanting to aspire to have, you know, small you service industries mm -hmm. that will now in turn create wealth and, you know, create employment. Okay, okay, let Luki come in. But in the absence of all of that, of we all look in one direction, government, which is government. government. Rookie. <laughs> Very interesting. Now, I've just been listening to um, the debate. Everyone is really saying the same thing as um, Abra said. The bottom line is corruption is, is still a very big factor in government in Nigeria, and government is still the biggest business in Nigeria. And until we get that business to be disincentivized, remove money from um, serving as a government official, like in the UK, where you have a job, and then you go and do part-time parliament work, I think we're going to still have these issues, where you can issue bogus, bogus contracts, say you are doing high scene cleaning in NDDC or whatever it is. So at the end of the day, the idea that we are corrupt is still a huge problem. The idea that the economy is not working for us is still a huge problem. And we need to still talk about this. No matter what, you can see all the other countries, uh, Russia, uh, Saudi Arabia, they're all corrupt. And we know they are, but like you said, the economies can sustain their own corruption. We can't. Nothing works in Nigeria. And so that is still a topic that we must um, talk about. And so, you know, that's, that's my own submission. We still need to tackle it at that and make sure that people who are elected to work cannot have money. So make the money go away. And they have the real professionals do jobs. You can't have um, people that you um, appoint do forensic audits. I mean, are they accountants? So these, these are just ridiculous ideas that we, like you said, politics is, is um, we're using politics to make us even poorer. Okay, and well, thank you. Thank you, Rookie, for that. Um, that's all we have time for on this segment. So David is saying it's time to grow up, whereas I'm saying it's time to get ready for battle after the break. Okay, ready or not, here I come is as much a warning as it is a last minute call to action. Are you battle ready? For those who have lived through a civilian or even a world war, certain experiences were known to be become commonplace. According to World War II Chronicles by Dr. Martin Jonas, the war affected every aspect of daily life and meant that everyone endured hardships and sacrifices. People's weariness with these hardships was as much a threat to popular morale as the physical dangers of war, he said. He documented that for six years, people suffered rationing of foods and dust to dawn blackouts to prevent aiding the German bombers. For Biafran war survivors, such as my parents, rationing was also a survival necessity, as well as being ever ready to move from place to place, combined with taking shelter in a bunker during times of heightened alert. It would be an exaggeration to say that COVID-19 is the world war we never had to endure, and yet I compare our experience today with those of our predecessors to show how in spite of the incomparable conditions of hardships they experienced, we're still found wanting. We are the generation that are exposed as lacking in mental and emotional stamina to endure discomfort for the sake of the greater good. Now I could postulate that this is due to our lack of social cohesion and increasingly fragmented sense of moral values. Nonetheless, we are where we are. Today, we're asked to endure a lockdown, wear face masks, and maintain social distancing. And many are grumbling, refuse to cooperate, and even go on protests. Some conveniently, if hypocritically, query the reality of the virus, or, which as far as I'm concerned is just as dangerous, they sow seeds of confusion by undertaking what amounts to a social media trial by jury amidst this global warfare. A house divided against itself, filling the gaps. In countries like China, Japan, and Florida, we've seen what amounts to a second wave with global lessons that we would be well advised to take note of. Starting with Florida, which was one of the first states to impose a lockdown and successfully combat the virus in April. Indicators of a second wave were evident by June after they moved to ease the lockdown. In Japan, 
Suzuki Naomichi, the governor of Hokkaido, announced on March 18th, after three weeks of lockdown was lifted, that the region had contained the outbreak. By April 12th, less than a month later, he warned that Hokkaido was facing a crisis of a second wave and reimposed a state of emergency. In China, the mere whiff of the return of the virus was met with a warm mood response. More than 7 million residents of the city of 22 million were tested for COVID-19, while schools, bars, and beauty parlors were shot. And a forensic approach to contact tracing required that anyone who had close contact with an infected person must quarantine for 28 days. Now, the lesson from these countries is that we need to toughen up and not ease down. Stop putting our head in the sand like the proverbial ostrich. Coronavirus may well be here for us some time. We must love ourselves and our neighbors enough not to carelessly put one another at risk. Although some measures I admit are not practical to take, we must do what little we know to do and be consistent with it. And whereas government agencies mustn't grow wary of sensitizing the citizenry, out of sight mustn't become out of mind. We all must consistently mentally arm ourselves for a drawn out battle. Yeah, um, Ekene, it's, it's, um, they say in the absence of information, rumor tribes, and um, when rumor tribes, even intellectuals are turned to convey your bets. And um, if you look at the way, you know, those people who are supposed to sensitize the rest of us, the way they have handled this COVID, it has, more, uh, it has been more of a scandemic than a pandemic. It has, more, it has been more of COVID-419 than COVID-19. And so when you are not able to pass the message, they say action speaks louder than words with your action. Look at, um, in the course of the week, if you see the traffic on Tonmelan Bridge, even on that um, Akwangbo Bridge and Sulere Aziz, you now begin to ask yourself, you know, so where are these people going and where are they coming from? And because the attitude of government to all of these things is as if COVID has disappeared from Nigeria. So, and then you also hear, you only hear of breaking news when one as governor or one rich man dies of COVID. You don't hear of the ordinary man. So the impression, the message it passes is that it's a sickness of big man. And then the attitude, the government that tells you wear fixed masks, you see police jam packed in a van, no fixed masks. You see last man, all of them sandwiched in a van, no fixed masks. These are people who are supposed to be sensitizing. Mm -hmm. And so it looks as if, you know, this is a punishment to the rest of us. Meanwhile, this will protect the ordinary people. And then you go to hospitals. Any, every patient is COVID-19 patient. There are no explanation for it. You know, information is missing. And so when people hear, hear of this, there's self-medication, there are even the available um, isolation centers, you know, you get there, the, imagine Lagos State coming out to tell us that they feed, or that they, they, they are feeding, or is it treating one patient with 100,000 to 1 million one million naira mm -hmm. per day. Okay, no, they clarify that. You know, people so, picked out that bit. Yes, yeah, so that that's what I'm saying. So when you hear stuff like that, because of social media, you should be careful the kind of information you pass mm -hmm. to the people. Mm -hmm. And so in the midst of hunger, you hear of uh, NDDC, you know, how people are spending yeah. money to sensitize COVID. Mm -hmm. And then you begin to ask yourself, maybe mm -hmm. this COVID is actually an opportunity to make money. Mm -hmm. And so that's why government, like I, I like your advocacy, let government step up not just with campaigns and slogans, but with their action. The actions yeah. will send more message than the slogans. The rookie U.S. They agree <laughs> with Libras. <laughs> the 409 approach in Nigeria is really startling. To be honest with you, we can't really ask people to lock down and don't have any source of income, no social welfare. Like I was talking on TV the other day, um, Canada was giving $2,000 a day for every worker who had, um, um, had um, like a tax returns the previous year for the low-income workers, and businesses were giving $40,000 loans with a $10,000 forgiveness if you pay back early in two years, and it was an interest-free loan. So when you do things like that, people can actually adhere to what you're preaching. Now, when a man has nothing to eat and there's no source of income, and you tell them to stay home and lock down, they'll think, is it better for me to die of hunger or to die from COVID-19? And so they don't really, they can't adhere. So what are we doing in Nigeria to ensure that we do real palliatives that reach people, not the NDDC type where they share the money to themselves first. And meanwhile, they're having their full salaries and their full benefits and giving travel allowances to places that don't even exist mm -hmm. when they're locked down internationally. What am I saying? 
if you want to um, implore people to obey you, you have to support them. You have to be compassionate with them. There's a lady that just came on TV, I'm sure you heard her, saying that if you take chloroquine, you won't yeah, catch Dr. COVID. Stella. So therefore, don't wear face masks. I think that is absolutely really dangerous to do that because there's no evidence that shows that. So, uh, you, you see, the way I see it is that I agree with all of you that there's a, the, 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 this attitude to COVID-19 makes it look like a scam. First of all, you have a president who is almost 80 years old and he has refused to wear a mask. He's in a very dangerous age bracket. Um, he he could wore drop one off. the other day. He could drop <laughs> off. Yeah, he wore it to Mali because they wouldn't have probably let him into Mali if he didn't wear it. That's, <laughs> that, that, you, that, that's the saddest thing that you know, has happened in the COVID thing for me. Mm. If the president looked like somebody who feared COVID-19, the message would get around better. Look at Boris Johnson. Boris Johnson actually looked like somebody who really wanted to get rid of this COVID. He caught it. Caught it, mm. went through it, came out. Maybe it helps that he's a very bushy kind of person that doesn't look like he's looking after himself and all he just wants to do is to work, even if many will say he's not working. But that's a matter of, you know, <laughs> opinion, because I think Politics. it is. And um, that's much better. But when you have the president who simply will not wear it at his age, then why do you think um, a strong last man, man, man. Uh, oh, will fear COVID-19. Okay, David. Well, I mean, from an international point of view, like what, how it's handled in Nigeria and how it's handled outside of Nigeria, two very different things. Mm -hmm. I think like what the example you, you referenced in the US, for example, where people are having protests over wearing masks. Even, yeah, even I in think, the UK, would yeah. you believe? Yeah. I think these are first world problems. I think they probably are problems that they have light. Yeah, <laughs> they have, they too, have, they have they, too much freedom. Pretty much. So, because... Like in this part of the world, I think we're already used to inconveniencing ourselves to a certain extent. Even but, just, but even among people I know, just they just don't wear living, face masks. They don't well, the thing social is, distancing. the thing is, if if they were, they know better. if it was enforced, if they were required to in this they part of the world, they wouldn't go out and protest. They would just grumble. But what I'm and saying is, like, do we do not it. know enough now but to do the right thing? That's what I was saying. Well, I mean, what is the problem? <laughs> why do Nigerians not think it's? You, you don't want real. to inconvenience yourself. That's my own assessment. Well, Ekene speaks of a drawn-out battle whereas some of us were born in the battlefield. We are born ready. I'm set to kick into action after the break. Five panelists, five topical issues, no holds barred. For me, it's not knowledge that's lacking. It's that greed, it's that mentality where you feel you deserve to take your own and take it infinitely and let everybody else just manage however they will manage. We're almost becoming hardwired to try and cheat. I would, you know, suggest that we begin to hold our leaders accountable there was a time in this country when yes. things actually worked. I don't think that any organization should be above the law. And I think one of the challenges we have in this country is about governance across the board. Well, well, what I'm saying is that it doesn't really affect us in Nigeria. I don't know what we can do if the system is already corrupted. We've been warned as a continent of the influx of the Chinese. If you don't repay your debt, they will just to colonize you. In developed countries, if you want to be rich, you become an entrepreneur or what you call a businessman or woman. But in Nigeria, if you want to be rich, find your way into government or do jobs with government. That's why we now have contract bazaar for foreign companies. There are most foreign companies doing jobs with our government in Nigeria, aided by ministries, departments, and agencies, and even the Bureau of Public Procurement observes our statutory pro procurement procedures in breach is an understatement. Otherwise, how do you explain the fact that companies that were tried and convicted abroad for procurement breach in Nigeria are still the favorite bidders here? Our knack for everything foreign, you would say. Same way it is easier for the camel to pass through the eye of a needle that for a fresh graduate to find a job in Nigeria. Examples, you must be 23 years old with four years working experience despite that strike. It's the same way indigenous companies are finding it difficult getting big jobs in Nigeria as it has become a fertile ground for Chinese and other foreign companies. Even when indigenous companies get through the bidding processes, the Bureau of Public Procurement, BPP, will substitute these indigenous companies with foreign ones. There are even allegations that some contractors are calling for the probe of the Director General of the BPP, Maman Amadu, and the activities of BPP 
on the modalities for awarding certificates of no objection on most government contracts. Even the NDDC recent probe further exposed all these allegations. Some have even alleged that the DG of BPP in some cases intentionally disqualified some companies to give an edge to some foreign companies or companies from the northern part of the country. No wonder there are a lot of allegations of sectionalism and nepotism against President Buhari as some of his appointees and aides are also not happy matters. And the earlier he does something about it, the better. Some indigenous contractors are recently contemplating boycotting bidding for government contracts to avoid the attendant loss of their little earnings as the cost of purchasing some of these bidding documents also does not come cheap. Who does this thing, Seth? Contracts as simple as road constructions are intentionally awarded to cronies without compliance with the Bureau of Public Procurement Act. For example, also, Nigerian Port Authority has intentionally, since 2015, refused to award major contracts to indigenous companies on the ground that they have not done major jobs with government before. Despite the fact that the foreign companies executing these jobs were indicted in their own countries for bribing the same MPA officials here to want to grow Nigeria. I bet tell me something else. Even jobs as easy as wreck remover or what you call underwater rubble clearing that can be executed by any underwater weather is, uh, is awarded to foreign companies despite training as militants in underwater welding. How then do we intend to create jobs for our teaming youths, especially given the COVID-19 financial loss, when government refused to patronize indigenous companies? How do we expect our locals to compete when we intentionally disqualify them from getting local jobs? The militants we are training in underwater welding abroad, where do we intend them to get jobs from? If we give away jobs meant for them to foreign companies, Yet we do not see the correlation between this attitude and youth restiveness, breeding insecurity. It's even alleged in some quarters that this happened because it is easier for these foreign companies to launder funds for our officials, as the provision of the Nigeria Investment Promotion Act allow them to take out their profit 100%, despite not bringing a Kobo into the country to invest, like I always do. I would therefore advocate that government should not only make laws to encourage local participation, but there should be concerted effort from the administration to look into the procedure of awarding certificate of no objection to most of these foreign companies by the Bureau of Public Procurement and ensure that our local companies are encouraged to create work by giving them jobs that will enable them to compete, not only locally, but within West African sub-region. That way, government will not just be creating jobs, but will also be recycling words. Just like David had said, we need a bigger pie. Mind you, I'm not saying don't award jobs to foreign companies. But the ones Nigerian companies can do well, give them a right of first refusal. And sub jobs are many, so many of them. And ensure that such jobs are equitably distributed as qualified companies and not just domiciled in one section of the country only. And I will not rest until we collectively learn to make Nigeria first in everything that we do. I mean, there are very simple moves that this country is losing out on. If you, want, um, if you don't want to drive away foreign investment, which is very useful, but at the same time, you don't want to make it look like everything's for the foreigners, um, there are ways you could do it, tax incentives and all that for companies. So if you feel Nigerians can't do a particular task, but they can do parts of it under an, a foreign company, then let the foreign companies come in, but give them tax incentives to employ Nigerians in certain parts of the job, mm -hmm. so that it is not by force that you're telling them to give it to Nigerians, uh, because they will run away anyway eventually, and then you lose out. So it's a case of this balance. We're not ready to balance. We're not ready to balance with the overseas people, and as liberals have said, even within Nigeria, it's all sectionalized. All the jobs appear to be going to one side of the country since we had uh, a president from 2015. And um, so whether we're in or out, it looks like there's no difference. I, th I think it's multifaceted, the problem, from what he's saying. Because on the one hand, when he started doing the advocacy, I was saying to myself, is it really true, again, that the reason it's going to foreign companies is because of that bias or because those foreign companies would deliver, like Judas Berger, for example. 
most people would opt for them because we know how some of our contractors behave. I know the stress I'm going through one of the banks. If I name them now, they should really hide in shame. For three days, we've had downtime. They haven't bothered to send you even a, any information to say what. So the service delivery is very poor here. Sorry to be down on us. So why would I go and, so, the, um, for, so there are companies that you would opt for just because they have a, a name that you can stand by. But there's the nepotism, so that's another aspect. You know, I like your idea where you're saying, even if the foreign company is preferred to do it, then employ because you need to transition us into the job. We Correct. can't forever be recipients yes. of you know, other people's, and they are making money. You look at the Chinese using sense to say they must use their own people, they must use their, can't we negotiate? Why must we be negotiating like we don't have our best interests at heart? But the nepotism because one, how, we don't. how do we plug, they don't, it's just themselves. How do we plug the gap? I'm thinking that anybody who gives a contract out to their neighbor or their brother or their cousin, and that brother doesn't deliver, they should put down a kind of surety for that person. They'll come after you if that road develops potholes. Because why should you be able to say, I'm giving contracts out, and that's where your own job ends? And then we'll deal with whatever, undelivered contracts, poorly delivered contracts. There must be some accountability. I totally agree. So what, I, what you said there, uh, Kine, imagine Chinese companies fixing lifts and doing different um, infrastructure building. And everything is written in Chinese. So even when they go, you still have to call them back to do repairs. Mm -hmm. When even a simple um, nail and hammer job, they would bring Chinese people to do it. It's so ridiculous. So what um, you're saying, what Rika said, you know, bring in the capacity if we don't have it, but even, even empowering us, even we can learn yeah. under your tutelage to, to get those same skills. And part of the contracts, especially the billion and trillion dollar ones, should uh, make sure that they pass on skills and training to our own um, um, Nigerian exactly. people so that we can, we can gain from that after we're paying for this. We, we also need to um, transfer um, technology and skills. Yeah. So for sure, you know, all the documents um, Labour has talked about um, to get a simple job, get, um, get um, PENCOM, uh, ITF, whatnot, cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, well, of Naira, sorry. And it's very expensive. And in the end, you may not even get the job. Okay. And so you so spent all this money trying to get paperwork, and, and you don't have this job. So what's the sense in it? You know, and of course, there's no, you already know who you're going to award the contract to in the first instance. And so all that is a charade. Yeah, because quickly, so that I, I can um, just a few 30 seconds to, you, you find out that most of these companies, it, you call Julius Berger, for example. So I didn't want to mention names. Julius Berger had been here. Unlike India, when Telecom got to India, they said, look, 20% will allow you to bring it. The rest you would do here. So we can transfer technology. Our people will learn these things. And then the Opal Cottage industry. We've had Julius Berger for eternity. We can't even boast of empowering you know, an indigenous company to begin to compete. Meanwhile, where they are coming from. Technically, Julius Berger is not foreign. That's, I read anymore. that as well. Uh, uh, any, 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 any OK, but we have but, to wrap it up. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. But we, ha we can't say we have empowered, yeah. you know, transfer technology to indigenous one to be able to compete and bring in the kind of equipment that they bring. Meanwhile, where they are coming from, their countries are empowering, you know, other locals. Anyway, this is a topic for, we'll continue the discussion. Whereas some may be open to offer from the highest bidder, we are ever open to the opinion you have to tender. No backhand fees required. Idris Hamza says, it is sad to know that all we can do is advocate and more advocacy. That never leads us anywhere. Talking is what we do best in Nigeria, where the criminal leaders have their way. Even when we have a group of persons sacrificing to initiate the revolution for a change that we all yearn for, programs like the Advocate are quick to technically overanalyze the process of the initiative and how it would have been done better, as if there's a university accepted, universally accepted method of initiating a revolution that will galvanize Nigeria against these wicked, heartless, and unrepentant thieves that have stole their way into the power. How long are we going to endure these successive failure le failed leaders? How long should we continue to talk and advocate? Idris, so you are frustrated. Does that mean we should cease discussion? Like David said, we offer solutions alongside our analysis. Thank you for your feedback, feedback though. We, we can't, this is like, for me, this is like a bigger university where you can lecture as many people as you can. Ignorance also is a big problem here. Melissa Bondex has this to say. You guys are doing well. So much love from Midland, Texas. Love you all, but Ekene is my sweetheart. Oh, really? I'm your sweetheart too, you should know that. 
And MS Continental says, good job, guys. A great narrator you are. My guy sitting in the middle. Oh, that should be me. Yes. A great guy, great guy. You see, I have, I have, a, have, I have some fans too. <laughs> Thanks, Melissa. Thanks, Miss Continental. When all is said and done, we all speak as one man or one woman as we advocate towards a better society. Advocate with us on our social media platform on Facebook, Plus TV Africa, hashtag the Advocate NG, or on Twitter and Instagram at Plus TV, hashtag the Advocate NG. To catch up with previous broadcasts, just simply go to plustvafrica.com forward slash the advocate. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Plus TV Africa. Up next, Rookie is set to straighten out his system rigged against women. Right behind you, Rookie. Yay, I'm here. Five panelists, five topical issues, no holds barred. For me, it's not knowledge that's lacking. It's that greed. It's that mentality where you feel you deserve to take your own and take it infinitely and let everybody else just manage however they will manage. We're almost becoming hardwired to try and cheat. I would, you know, suggest that we begin to hold our leaders accountable. There was a time in this country when yes. things actually work. I don't think that any organization should be above the law. And I think one of the challenges we have in this country is about governance across the board. Well, well, what I'm saying is that it doesn't really affect us in Nigeria. I don't know what we can do if the system is already corrupted. We've been warned as a continent of the influx of the Chinese. If you don't repay your debt, they will just colonize you. When is enough really enough? So might ask. Whenever we've had enough, will be the answer. Women in politics, a system rigged against women. For too long, women have been excluded, discriminated, marginalized, underrepresented in our government, in the policies, in our programs. And we are so tired of this exclusion. I ran to become a member of the House of Representatives, um, Nigeria Lower House of Parliament in 2019 elections under the APC platform. And to describe my experience, <laughs> it would be the entire hour of this advocacy and I will not have done justice to it. Now, wow. That encounter is in part a reflection of common cultural stereotypes that challenge women and their roles in politics. This in addition to other barriers such as lack of finance, religious beliefs, violence and weak internal party democracy have held women back for several decades. Despite being a patriarchal society, Nigeria has a rich history of women breaking out of the mold to participate in politics. I'm talking about our pre-colonial history and women, um, the exploits of Queen Amina of Zaria, who led armies to drive out invaders from Zaria and um, Moremi of Vileife, whose sacrifice to our people speaks to selfless leadership that we are so bereft of these days. And our recent um, um, past speaks of prominent women, women like Fumilayo Ransom Kuti, I'm sure you all know Fela's mother, late Fela, a crusader and challenger of uh, despotic leaders who led about women on the protest against taxation. Margaret Echo, a prominent civil rights activist, and Hadjia Gambo Sawaba, who championed the cause of the oppressed in northern Nigeria. Iyalo De Tinubu of Lagos exemplifies the rich participation of women in our economic sin. Now, the legacies of these women are really now at risk of extinction today. Since 1999, when Nigeria returned to democratic governance following um, years of military rule. No woman has even been elected as president, ha, vice president, or even governor of any of the country's 36 states. In Nigeria, women have been playing subordinate roles and have not even been given any independent um, role in political um, acting. Even though women constitute about 49% of Nigeria's um, 200 million strong population, only seven out of 109 senators are women. Imagine in the House of uh, Reps where we have 360 members, only 22 of these members are female. So in, in all of this, we recognize that our existential gap in the national policy on women, they formulated a policy in 2000 and later replaced by the national gender policy in 2006, 
which calls for affirmative action for the greater inclusion of women in politics. Yet despite these key measures, progress has been really slow. Even the gender and the call opportunity bill aiming to tackle the forms of discrimination against women and con consequently promote gender equality in politics, education and employment, marriage and inheritance has been stalled till today since 2010. No bill has been passed. So at the end of July in 2018, about 150 aspiring women politicians from different parts of Nigeria flock to Abuja for some women's aspirants summit. And the goal was to combine forces to ensure women are duly represented across all levels of government. And for the first time in Nigeria's history, six women actually ran for president compared to the last election in 2015 when Professor Ra I'm sure you all remember, Remy Sunaya was the only female who was the presidential candidate. And obviously, because of all this awareness, the numbers increased sig significantly across board for women to be elected in office. Yet, the results were still abysmal. As you see, I still stay here. I wasn't even giving tickets. Anyways, we, we countries like Senegal, um, Rwanda, South Africa, which have quotas for women in parliament, we've seen a rise in the number of women um, lawmakers. Actually, in Ethiopia, Abi Ahmed decided, she's the prime minister, to reserve half of our ministerial um, positions for women. Now, when you use quotas, it actually jumpstarts the equality process and it begins um, to bring something of a change in, in this um, field. We all recently witnessed the um, Bruhaha and showdown in the, as um, Chuka, we called them, Nadem Dem Commission, aka NDDC, where the former acting MD, um, Joy Nunez, accused the current minister of the Niger Delta, Godswill Akpavio, of impropriety and um, sexual harassment. And he replied and retorted that her previous four husbands and therefore poor temperament and bad character should be consulted. How does the personal attack here address the concerns she raised? When does a man get asked how many wives or how many sexual partners he has as, a, as his resume or competency to do a job that he was hired for? And what is this double standard? My advocacy, therefore, is for the federal government to establish a constitutional, constitutionally backed quota system that will tackle the gender imbalance problem in Nigerian politics. I want political parties to have a compulsory quota reserved for women and also encourage women in politics to create a platform where experienced female politicians can offer mentorship to young female politicians and also offer them insights, you know, to how to, to do their elections and be successful, um, well, I call them elected members in, and make a good campaign. This is my advocacy. So if I could Over uh, to you. start the conversation here. Um, I agree in principle with the idea of some sort of uh, quota reserve for, for women, because as we know, women are half of the population and they're extremely underrepresented in the political equation. My, my reservation, though, is twofold. My reservation, my reservation is not about the idea of a quota system in itself, but it's twofold, and I'll explain what I mean. So using an example from the continent first, I, uh, you mentioned, uh, I think it was... Uh, Ethiopia. Rwanda. Rwanda. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a very interesting example because I believe that the, number, the proportion of women in the parliament is 50-50, so 50% male. something, yeah. Now, the funny thing about that is that when a woman did to run against Paul Kagame in the last Rwandan presidential election, her name was Victoria Ingabire, she was thrown into prison and her nude photos were leaked. So it's, oh. it's important to, to understand that there are certain African leaders like, Paul, like uh, the Rwandan guy, uh, Kagame, like the Ethiopian guy, Abiy Ahmed, they're very good at using women to do PR optics. for themselves. It's for optics. It's not necessarily, they're not necessarily part of the power structure at all. It's just they're, they're figureheads, they're puppets. Yeah, that's the, that's so it's very important to keep that in mind. Well. So a quota doesn't necessarily solve, solve that, that problem. Mm -hmm. And secondly, from a Nigerian point of view, what I'm scared of is how we use quotas in Nigeria. Yeah. Now, an example of a quota that is successful is the affirmative action system in the US, which basically states that 
of every of uh, a number of qualified candidates, there's a reserved quota for a specific group of people. But everybody there is qualified, first of all. If you're not qualified, whether, whether you're in that group yeah. of people or not, you're not going to be included. Yeah. In Nigeria, what we do is completely different. Yes. We say even if a goat <laughs> is from a group of people, is from a particular <laughs> reserved group, and that yeah. fits the quota, we put that goat in. So what I'm, afraid, what I'm afraid could happen here is that you create a quota system for female politicians, and that will just simply ensure that the very worst of them end up yeah, dominating. That's, that's, <laughs> okay, Libra, that's, go for that's, clapping to that say is, something. See, uh, David, that's just ice the cake, because it's the same thing they do when they say, you know, youth in politics. Okay. You know, you look for the worst youth. amongst the youths, yeah. and then you say, well, you're looking for young people. Take this is the young this people. The young so you're looking for women. Oh, yes, don't worry, we'll give you women. women yes. And so you bring the worst amongst them. And then if it is about, look, the first and foremost should be about you know, qualification. Okay. For you to get there, whether male or female, you mm -hmm. must be qualified. There is a process that we all must pass through. And then for that process, 60% for this, 40% for this, or 50% for women, qualified women, 40% for qualified men. Mm -hmm. When you do that, you know that the women we know that, okay, yes, we have 40%, and it must be amongst the ones that are qualified. Mm -hmm. So a Professor Shonaya, for example, will, the women supporting her will not be looking at their shoulders. And then you'll find that the women that will support her will be the qualified one also, mm -hmm. to say, yes, this is one of the best amongst us. Mm -hmm. But when it's just, oh, filling the quota, mm -hmm. most of the women also will tell her, typical of Nigeria, oh, look, you don't have the, the numbers. And, and so we need to make concerted efforts mm -hmm. and not just say, oh, we need more women in politics. If it's about more women in politics, you're going to have them. No, I mean, again, they, I mean, they will I mean, give them really, to you. I but probably have to agree with Libros and uh, David. Um, but really, I also to agree with you, because it will jumpstart the process. Yeah. There's no doubt, because it's yeah. so tipped in. The, I mean, the figures you gave are just, it's a shame. Mm -hmm. But I would say that in the same way, because I've done an advocacy on this before, that women, the right women are not, there's a deficit. <laughs> There's also a deficit of the right men. We just have the wrong kind of people in politics. Yeah. So we need to make the system more, Iriano, ena Iriano. more enabling for Iriano. everybody. But then I also look at the recent incident. Um, what state was it? Where, um, what's her name? Salome Acheju was burned to death in her house, a female representative. Yeah. And then you also have this other lady, Natasha Akboti, who was bullied out of her own campaign. And what was done about that? So I, I, we still want to see, for those who are even brave enough to stick their neck out, what kind of an enabling environment are we providing for these women? And, and, but I'm very behind your forming a platform. I've even it. encouraged people like Remy Shonaya. I'm behind any woman that can now form a platform. I will get on that platform with you. You too, my but sister. Qualified or form not. a platform. Let's yeah, go and let's get, we have the numbers. Let's yeah, go we'll grassroots. Let's um, empower the right women yeah, to no, go ahead of us. We time. desperately yeah. need that representation. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, I, I think we should still have the, the what do you call it? The, um, the quota. The quota system, mm -hmm. yes. It doesn't matter that it's flawed. Let, let's just start Everything there. in Nigeria is flawed. So mm -hmm. let's still have a system. Yeah, to serve the some purpose. The system is correct. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the whatever is flawed, the execution mm -hmm. is flawed. It's like having a constitution, but we're not doing anything yeah. about the constitution. Oh. Uh, sorry, I just also want to add, the, the 2018 bill I read, can you believe that the people there who stopped it from going, some of the reasons they were quoting was I was anti-Sharia law, because one of the things they would do is to, to insist Colors that a girl, Christ. or the Bible, or whatever they were quoting, that a girl could not get married before the age of 18. And so a lot of times they're safeguarding their own selfish interests. They're not really representing us. We need more people there who are representing us. All those Why men should there, the girl they're not representing be married us. in any case? An 18-year-old has no business being in a marriage. There you, but some people say, no, 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 no. <laughs> okay. I don't say my own. Uh, anyway. Yeah. Well, we well, Rookie has certainly had enough, and so have we. Up next, I'll be addressing another enduring practice, for better or worse. You're watching The Advocate on Plus TV Africa. When behaviors become automated, some might call it a habit. Might it not be termed also a ritual? So today, anyway, um, I'm going to talk about the ritual of life and um, I'll just take you on a nice journey. It is the ritual and relentless monotony of life that leads to the various crises. And without these crises, how could I have gotten through almost 55 years on earth? You see, it's no wonder that I'm bored with church, bored with Lagos, bored with people, and certainly numb regarding Nigeria's lack of progress. 
It's the same old thing every day for over 20,000 days. But curiously, I'm not bored of my children or architecture. I wonder why. Now, I believe everyone else is bored as well. And because the idle mind is the devil's workshop, it is not surprising that we tend to resort to bad deeds to enliven our, enliven our experience. Boredom is rife in Nigeria, so we turn to lives of vice. Boredom correlates with bad, not good. Active lives result in good thoughts. Should we eschew corruption and sin in exchange for hard work and good deeds, there'd be a lot more smiles and a lot more good. It's almost medicinal. You will never find what you want in monotony. Ritual kills life. That's why no one likes school, Sunday service, meal times. It is, to change, it is time to change how we live. And the COVID break has shown us how we could have been living all this time. Cool down the pace of life, vary the days and weeks. You see, we need people who can inject fun into life. For instance, we had a short-lived experience in school in Wari, Nigeria, in the 1970s, when a new physics teacher came to teach us. His name was Mr. Nwadike. He drove a very nice Volvo, told us he should be known as Big Brother. He had a rough afro and claimed he had only just come back from Texas. He said he was rich and was only teaching for fun, the lucky sword. He absented himself a lot from class. Any lesson he managed to make was great. So one day, I wrote a letter to the principal and asked my classmates to sign. It was a petition against Big Brother. Some refused to sign, especially those in the Christian Union Society. Anyhow, the letter was written and Big Brother was removed. And physics went back to being consistent but dull. I actually felt something of an anticlimax when he was gone, like I personally sacked him. So you see, I understand why men of yore had many wives. It was to kill boredom. Uh, sorry, the director says I should off the mic, so it's okay. <laughs> Honorable Chuka, please. <laughs> off your mic. You're off, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's enough, <laughs> please. Which guy is <laughs> Why is um, you kill boredom? Really, okay. oh, wow. But really, uh, I, I, I've had a lot. Uh, just last week, a friend of mine, um, Kunle, said he was bored of uh, sitting down in Lagos, so he just needed to go somewhere. And um, so don't mind me, oh, mm. I create a lot of activities around me. Yeah. Even right from COVID lockdown, I had palliative committee. <laughs> I would jog every morning just to create activities, just, you know. And like they say, variety is the spice of life. Mm. And um, in, the, in these times, there are a lot of people who are actually bored. Mm. And so that's why, for me, I try to take out, you know, time to reach out to one or two persons, you know, every day. Just put a smile on somebody's face. Um, whether we like it or not, I agree with you. Sometimes men of your, you know, <laughs> they get married for to avoid boredom, whether we take it or not. That's why even young men of these days, they keep one at home and have other ones outside. <laughs> but then, that said, quickly, 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 no, but really, but really, I don't, that's, that's not the area, that's not the area I want to dwell on. No, no, just saying, yes, but to, on, on this, so lastly, um, I also, you know, agree completely that now that with what the experience that COVID has taught us, we should also learn that most of these things that we do, you know, through um, being monotonous, we can do them in other ways by adding fun. I had a lecturer who taught me um, civil procedure using Pidgin English mm -hmm. in the university. Mm -hmm. And most of the things he taught me are the things I remember today. The ones he taught with good English, I can barely yeah, remember. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Interesting. I mean, uh, <laughs> did you want to say something, Rookie, before I chop, I jump? Yes. Well, I, we know Chuka and I went to the same secondary school, let me see worry. <laughs> and when he talked about a teacher that I removed, I remember one teacher that they brought as a youth service, a youth copper teacher. Her name was Mr. K. Chuku. I don't know if you remember how Chuka. She had <laughs> one fair lady with very tight pencil skirts. And everybody wanted to do chemistry as a result of yes. this fine lady. Yeah. So what I'm saying is, it's very true. Whoever is talking about any subject can make it interesting. And people actually will learn the subject as a result. Mm. And life doesn't have to be monotonous, as you said. And you really do not need to marry 
more than one person to be having a very interesting <laughs> marital life at home. Okay, I'm a physician. We teach a lot mind. of things. The mic, mic is off. The mic is off. Same style. <laughs> Don't keep doing the same thing every day. Change it up. You understand? Sometimes you go outside, you know, take a walk in the garden, be a little bit more romantic. I'm sure you people Which know what I'm doing with that. That's <laughs> <laughs> the rude. Which garden? <laughs> this COVID <laughs> lockdown <laughs> has created a lot of opportunity for families to bond. For example, Ruka and me, I'm never in one place for a long time because of my various commitments as a Nigerian politician, as a physician and whatnot. And so this lockdown has closed borders and um, I am stuck here with my family. And to be honest with you, I don't think I've had a better time than, than now my, my blood pressure is down. Wow, anyway, excellent. over to you. Yeah. Do you want to? I mean, I'm I'm the wrong person to ask about boredom because my life is anything but boring. So <laughs> <laughs> I just turned thirty, so I have that privilege over everybody oh, on this panel. Us, yeah. You know, um, that's what you think. He thinks right? yeah. for now, yeah. <laughs> you, have an age better. you know, even with COVID, you know, I still died. And by virtue of the work that I do, mm -hmm. so I'm always here, there, and everywhere. I'm divorced as well, so that helps. Mm -hmm. That I don't have, you know, I have obviously. So you, you are know, one of those that. Chuka is talking about. Looking for greener <laughs> pasture. You marry one, you divorce. You marry another one, you divorce. You well, hopefully not, one. but you know. No, okay, let me look at it from another, another, another perspective. Because listening to Chuka's um, uh, advocacy, <laughs> I, I was thinking that, yes, in a way, I sympathize with his observation that people get bored. And I was thinking, why do people get bored? It, it could be also because God designed us to be productive, you know, be fruitful and multiply. So when you're not productive and you're not seeing yourself going along a certain trajectory, you can feel a bit stuck in the mud, some people get depressed, some people then internalize their frustration and start to do either abuse alcohol or vices, like you call them. It can even but, be productive, can be bored. Or be fruitful and multiply. No, but you know, no, <laughs> yes, when uh, I'm coming, but what I'm trying to say is, on the other hand, but when it, because I'm not saying that monotony can be, it can be underestimated, because I, I value people who are con constant. I, I love, I have a lot of respect for people who are come rain, come shine, come boredom, they just stay, they're able to discipline themselves to continue to deliver, you know, whether it's a job, whether to, so for example, I want to big up my husband, you know, I was looking back at some pictures where like 20 something years married and want to, looking back at pictures and I'm like, 13 years ago and I'm, this guy was there, we went through some very difficult times but he was there like a, a stalwart, being the daddy figure, gingering, because at times I was so discouraged, but I could see from those videos, yeah, thank God, God, God use the he word, gingered God. me, <laughs> now I was frustrated, I was facing real challenges, not even boredom, you know, real proper psychological pressure. But he was there, he was a solid guy, he was a brick. And the same way, so I had to appreciate him, do my own Father's Day yesterday, because I said to myself, that is what I want in my life. People around me, so I try to be like that for others, because people I value in my life are people who are consistent. Whether come rain, come shine, they're there for you. you know? So I try to do that for others, Follow to help them to also. Because for me, how you handle boredom is what dis differentiates the boys from the men. If you do boredom and you start imploding and looking for second wives, you're still a child. No, no, I can't, <laughs> but I can't, if you can, you can firm up a muscular that's, up, no, I can't, that's then not you're the my issue. man. Being, being consistent also, consistently productive can be bored. Well, there you have it. As long as there's life, there'll be advocacy. So let's not tire of either in the interest of a better society. Continue to advocate with us on social media platforms, Facebook plus TV Africa. Hashtag the Advocate NG, or on Twitter and Instagram at Plus TV Africa hashtag the Advocate NG. And to catch up with previous broadcasts, go to plustvafrica.com forward slash the Advocate. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, also called Plus TV Africa. So till next time, same channel. Let's keep advocating for a better society. One conversation, one action at a time. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Rookie, bye-bye. Bye, bye. <laughs> bye, bye. <laughs> See you all. I miss being in the studio. Yeah, I know. I miss yes, What's studio. your big lift? Just jump on that aeroplane. Don't worry, aeroplane. don't worry. I'm, I'm arranging a PJ for you. Five panelists, five topical issues, no holds barred. For me, it's not knowledge that's lacking. It's that greed. It's that mentality where you feel you deserve to take your own and take it infinitely and let everybody else just manage however they will manage. We're almost becoming hardwired to try and cheat. I would, you know, suggest that we begin to hold our leaders accountable. There was a time in this country when yes. things actually work. I don't think that any organization should be above the law. And I think one of the challenges we have in this country is about governance across the board. Well, well, what I'm saying is that it doesn't really affect us in Nigeria. That's it, really it, 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 it does. I don't know what we can do 
if the system is already corrupted. We've been warned as a continent of the influx of the Chinese. If you don't repay your debt, they will just colonize you.